Hi guys, I'm Lisa. Welcome back to the channel. Usually I try to do either informative videos that are going to help you fight smarter or videos that encourage you to hang in. But this week is going to be neither of those. Our family has suddenly been hit by a lot of serious medical problems. Even the dog had to have a biopsy. The final straw was a phone call from an ICU doctor who told me that my sister was dying. They said her body was slowly shutting down and they didn't expect her to make it through the night. Four days later, she's still in critical condition, but she's still hanging in there. Tanya was born with Down syndrome. People like her experience discrimination almost every day. I've been looking out for her my whole life and fighting her battles is how I learned to fight my own. Most of you probably have someone in your life that has influenced what justice means to you. And for me, Tanya is that person. I have fought schools, government agencies, businesses, and a few individuals on Tanya's behalf. Fighting for myself didn't come so naturally. To me, thinking about myself made me feel selfish. But when I became disabled, I quickly came to the realization that if I didn't take care of myself, I wasn't gonna be around to take care of Tanya or anybody else. So just like when we're on an airplane and they tell us to put on our mask before we help anybody else, I metaphorically put on my mask and decided to help me for a change. Taking care of Tanya has made me part of a big community of people like her, their families, and the social workers who take care of them. And unfortunately, people like Tanya aren't the only members of our community who regularly experience discrimination. It may not be like this everywhere, but where we lived, most of the people who take care of people like Tanya are black women. And I saw those women put up with a lot of stuff that nobody should ever have to. One time I saw a white family member of one of the other clients dressing down one of the caregivers because he didn't want his loved one being taken care of by a woman of color. But the black woman that it was happening to was cool as a cucumber. <laughs> she just laughed and said, okay, I tell you what, you go find me a white woman who will do this work for this kind of money and we'll make that happen. And that shut him up because you didn't have to look far to tell they were scarce. The work those women do is exhausting, emotionally, physically, and financially. But they all love the kids they care for and that makes them good at their job. Unfortunately, it also makes it impossible for them to leave their work at the office when they go home at night. And over time, that takes a heavy toll. A lot of them end up burning out or getting seriously ill. And when those women break, their employers throw them away, just like the rest of us. I hate when that happens to anybody, but I especially hate it when it happens to public servants. Just here on the channel, I've run across soldiers, law enforcement officers, firefighters, educators, and other people who make their living by serving our collective needs. We should be taking better care of the workers who take care of us. But too many of us just sit by silently while their employers use them up and throw them away. I couldn't stop their employers from doing that. There were some things that I could do to help those women. I'd send them letters through the front office thanking them for going above and beyond for my sister. And that was easy because they go above and beyond every day. And for the ones who did get forced out, I offered to write letters of recommendation. I even wrote recommendations for some of them to go to graduate school. Mostly what I did was make sure that they knew that somebody appreciated what they were doing and was trying to help them. The point of telling you all that isn't to let you know how great I am. My motives for doing those things were actually pretty selfish. I wanted to be sure that my sister got good care. But even though I didn't mean them as good deeds, this week my good deeds came back to me anyway. Two of the young ladies that I'd written recommendations for graduate school ran into each other and they started talking about Tanya and me. So they called to see how we were doing. I didn't want to tell them that Tanya had just gone to the ICU, but I had to. Unfortunately, right now, my sister is still living in another state. I've been trying to move her here, but it's nearly impossible. They jumped in the car with their moms and their kids in tow and went to visit my sister. I asked them what they had been up to these days. And one of them was very excited because she had just gotten a brand new job. But the other one said she was on a break. Her previous job had made her sick and she had to quit. She's in her 20s and it's already hitting her. I'm all about fighting for change. But change isn't going to happen overnight. So in the meantime, the most important thing we can do is take care of our health. 
And for me, that meant changing how I worked. I stopped buying into the whole idea of the work family. Family is family. Work is work. We shouldn't have to feel guilty for missing a couple of days when our actual family needs us. We don't have to give 150% all the time. If 70% is all you can manage today, it's all you can manage. So it's good enough. Your new rules may not stop your employer from doing whatever it is they're going to do. But it'll protect your family, your health, and your sanity. Next week, I promise we'll be back to fighting smart and hanging in. And very soon, I'm going to start bringing you guys some interviews with other people who have fought their own EEOC battles. There's some amazing people in this community. So I'll see you guys next week. Until then, remember to put on your own mask first. Take care of yourself and hang in. Fight smart.